Hey everyone, welcome to Hands On Books. If you're new to the channel, the idea behind the show is to share my favorite hobby, which is book collecting. So I've got a pile of unopened, mostly used books that we pick from at random. If this is something that you like, please feel free to leave a comment and like the video, subscribe to the channel. Um, let's see what we get. All right, let's go. A giant sticker on the front so it's like a pretty maybe a cleanable copy of this book I feel like I ordered a year ago but I guess it was less than that um, The Gate of Heaven by Margaret Barker Let's see if this peels off yeah it looks okay funny to get one of these books. I can't remember why I bought it, but it, so the subtitle is The History and Symbolism of the Temple in Jerusalem. It's like most of this stuff will clean off. Nice. So let's read the back here. For over a thousand years, the temple in Jerusalem dominated both the city and its people. Yet although the first Christians were steeped in temple myths and symbols, the implications of this for our understanding of Christian origins have scarcely been explored. The Gate of Heaven introduces a wealth of lesser-known ancient texts and reveals how fundamental Christian beliefs such as the Incarnation and the Trinity had their roots in temple imagery, how the temple was the setting for all the apocalyptic writings of Judaism and Christianity, and how our understanding of the New Testament, early Christian writings, and even familiar hymns can be enriched by an awareness of their original context. This is an important new book by one of the most exciting and innovative scholars of Christian origins. Like Margaret Barker's previous books, The Older Testament and The Lost Prophet, it challenges many of the prevailing assumptions in biblical scholarship and throws fresh light on the foundations of the Christian faith. And the illustration, cover design by David Plum, and it's the seven-branched lampstand of the post-exilic period. Interesting. Yeah, so I don't remember what I was into when I ordered this book, but um, something, something got me interested about uh, the first temple. Um, the one that was destroyed by the Babylonians. Um, so this is so nine, 1991, so it's not a very old book. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Psalm 122 verses one to two. On the dedication for George Bibawi. All right, so I did have some notes on Margaret Barker that I put on a Word document a long time ago. Um, she's a British Methodist scholar who developed the approach called Temple Theology, which from the Wikipedia is an approach to biblical studies developed by Margaret Barker in her books, starting from The Great High Priest in 2003 and Temple Theology in 2004. This approach identifies some elements of the theology and worship of Solomon's temple that endured beyond Josiah's reform and survived in both early Christian theology and liturgy and Gnosticism. According to this view, temple theology has been influential in molding the roots of Christianity as well as, or even more than, Hellenistic or synagogue culture. So, yeah, this seemed like an interesting, still seems like an interesting book, and I'm glad that I ordered it six months ago. Um, so the general chapters are the house of the Lord, the garden, the veil, the throne, and, but Israel had no mythology. Sure. Let's read the first couple pages. 
For over a thousand years, there was a temple of the Lord in Jerusalem, which dominated both the city and its people. Even after the Roman destruction in AD 70, it continued to influence the thought and literature of the Jews. Christianity was born a few years before the destruction, and the first Jewish Christians, who wrote most of the New Testament, were steeped in its ways. The fourth gospel, the letter to the Hebrews, and Revelation were all directly inspired by the world of the temple. But what was this world? It is extraordinarily difficult to reconstruct the theology, the reasoning, the mythology, whatever it was which gave meaning to that place of worship. There is a reasonable amount of contemporary evidence for what it looked like and what happened to it at various times. Instructions survive about the sacrifices and rituals, about the rites, duties, and revenues of the priests, about the work of building and rebuilding, and so forth. But there is very little about the meaning of this whole gigantic system of worship which was at the heart of pre-Christian Judaism. Everything written about the meaning of the temple has to be derived from second and third hand, and we have to sift the surviving literature, both biblical and non-biblical, for anything which might be an illusion or a memory. There are enormous problems for anyone attempting to write about the temple, and I am only too well aware of them. There are few certainties and many possibilities. I shall begin with a brief account of the externals of the temple, the structure itself, how it was built and rebuilt, how it was furnished, how the services were conducted. Some of this material would be found in any standard treatment of the temple, but some would not, and I thought it important that an account of the temple should precede any reconstructions of the myths it expressed. This section is in no way comprehensive, but intended simply as a frame of reference to link features of the myths to the actual buildings. The temple was a place where the Lord appeared, a garden sanctuary, the place of the divine throne, the great bronze sea, the foundation rock and the altars. Sacrifice is mentioned in the broadest outline simply because any account of the temple which omitted this significant feature would be distorted. I make no attempt to interpret any of the sacrifices, except those of the Day of Atonement, since this has been done in countless books already. Nor have I dealt with the manifold complications of the lesser orders of the priesthood, since these, too, have been amply covered elsewhere. My main concern is with aspects of the temple mythology which are less well known, and I shall reconstruct them largely from extra-biblical texts, also less well known, to show the extent to which a wide range of themes and imagery had their common root in the temple. First, there will be evidence for the temple as a place of creation and renewal. These themes center upon the Garden of Eden, which the temple was built to represent. Second, there will be evidence for the temple as a place of mediation and atonement, themes associated with the veil of the temple which symbolize the boundary between the material and spiritual worlds. Third, there will be evidence for the temple as the place where some could pass beyond the veil and experience the vision of God, seeing into the essence of all things past, present, and future. These were the visions of the divine throne, which are best known from the revelation of St. John. In each case, I shall give one or two examples on how these ideas passed first into early Christian thought and then into the imagery of many well-known hymns. One of the most extraordinary aspects of temple mythology is that, for all the remoteness of its origins, it proves to be very familiar. All right, let's give it a smell. Yeah, it doesn't smell very... I mean, it's from the 90s, so it hasn't had time. All right, let's just read the first page. There have been three temples of the Lord in Jerusalem. The first was built by Solomon in the middle of the 10th century BC and destroyed by the Babylonians in 585 BC. The second was built by the exiles when they returned from Babylon and dedicated in 515 BC. The third was the temple enlarged and largely rebuilt by Herod the Great in 20 BC. Throughout its long history, the temple was the scene of violence and conflict, because temples were as much a statement of political status as they were evidence of piety. The power of the nation's god and king was reflected in the splendor of his cult and in the success of his people. Conversely, the defeat of a people was a sign that the god had been disgraced and his sanctuary desecrated. The first temple was a part of the palace complex built by Solomon, and for four centuries the kings in Jerusalem were central to its cult. The wickedness of the kings was blamed for its downfall, 
or so one of the histories tells us. Such sweeping judgments on the kings have colored most of the surviving evidence for the first temple, and this has almost certainly distorted the descriptions not only of the worship of the temple, but even of the building itself and its furnishings, since no part of the ancient temple was theologically neutral. Everything, buildings, furnishings, liturgies, sacrifices, vestments, calendar, everything was integrated, but what it expressed we can only guess. In the second temple period, there was a rain ritual associated with the Feast of Tabernacles, which has been recorded in minute detail in the Mishnah. Every day the pilgrims went out and gathered long, about four meters, willow branches which were placed upright all around the great altar in the temple court. When the altar was completely covered with greenery, the ram's horn trumpet was blown, and then the worshippers walked around the altar, each carrying his ethrog, a citrus fruit, and his lulab, a bundle of palm, myrtle, and willow, in accordance with Leviticus 2340. On the seventh day they walked round seven times, each time the procession sang, Save us, we beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech thee, give us success. Psalm 118, verse 25. I'm kind of interested in what that last chap chapter 5 has to say just because it had the most sort of strange title. But Israel had no mythology. For many years, it has been an orthodoxy of scholarship that Israel had no mythology. Mythology, we were told, was not possible in a monotheistic culture. Mythology was tales of divine and semi-divine beings, and Israel knew of only one. Mythology was for the lesser breeds without the law, it smacked of priestcraft and arcane rituals and was something which, quite obviously, any chosen people would have quickly outgrown. Israel, after all, was different. There have always been voices of dissent, scholars attempting to read behind the Psalms and prophets in order to reconstruct the ancient cult. Their works have been read with interest, but perhaps a little suspicion. What they wrote has not been ignored, but it has not been internalized and become the way the Old Testament is read. Mythology is one possible conclusion for Old Testament study, but still far from being an essential premise. Perhaps this is because it is too imprecise a study, or perhaps it is because the implications of any study of this mythology are rather painful. I can only speak for Christian scholars, but I have been acutely aware of an unwillingness actually to read the Old Testament as it is. There is a great concentration upon essential preliminary studies such as language and archaeology, and peripherals such as sociology and story, but very little by way of theology. This is in no small part due to the pressures of an ecumenical age. We avoid conflict with other Old Testament users by avoiding the discussion of anything that might lead to disagreement. Or, in church as opposed to academic circles, the Old Testament is simply regarded as obsolete and the New Testament is wrenched from its roots in the interest of making it immediately available to all. Yeah, I like, I like her writing. It's very forceful. It's like staking out its ground really well. One of the most remarkable descriptions of the heavenly throne is to be found in the songs of the Sabbath sacrifice which were found in fragments at Qumran and at Masada. Too little has survived for any extensive or certain translation to be made, but where there are substantial readable portions, the picture which emerges must alter forever what we understand as the background to Revelation or Hebrews. This must have been the way that the people of first century Palestine regarded their temple cult. The heavenly Debir was envisaged as a place of Elohim, i.e. gods or angelic beings, spirits of truth and knowledge who were many-colored and surrounded the throne. And this is a quote from uh, the fragments at Qumran, apparently. The cherubim bless the image of the throne chariot above the firmament, and they praise the majesty of the luminous firmament beneath his seat of glory. When the wheels advance, angels of holiness come and go, from between his glorious wheels, there is, as it were, a fiery vision of most holy spirits. About them the appearance of rivulets of fire and the likeness of gleaming brass, and a work of radiance and many-colored glory, marvelous pigments, clearly mingled. 
at their marvelous stations are spirits, many colored like the work of a weaver, splendid engraved figures. In the midst of a glorious appearance of scarlet, colors of the most holy spiritual light, they hold to their station before the king, spirits of pure colors in the midst of an appearance of whiteness. The likeness of the glorious spirit is like a work of art of a weaver. These are the princes of those marvelously clothed for service, the princes of the kingdom, the kingdom of the holy ones of the king of holiness in all the heights of the sanctuaries of his glorious kingdom. Yeah, I love seeing the, I really like um, having source books for like ancient texts. It's really fun to be able to pull that sort of thing off the shelf if you want. Yeah, I was kind of hoping that there would be some sort of diagram, like a detailed diagram of the um, of the temple in here, but I guess there isn't one. The building is sort of fascinating because, well, now the western wall is, I guess, the remainder of it in Jerusalem, but it's destroyed once by the Babylonians in the 6th century and then destroyed again by the Romans in the 1st century. Um... And I'll put an image of what it was supposed to have looked like under Herod the Great. And it just looks like an absolutely spectacular, you know, building. And I was more curious to learn about um, how they think the first temple developed. Yeah, I didn't really set out to uh, get interested in early Judaism, but that just sort of happened because I think that transition from uh, Canaanite religion to Judaism is really interesting. And, you know, out of all of the Canaanite tribes that we could be talking about right now, we're talking about the Jews. And they've had like this crazy, um, incredible impact on the world over the last 3,000 years. And it's interesting that everything else got kind of wrecked in the Bronze Age collapse, but that's when like the Phoenicians had their Golden Age and and so did Israel. So um, I, li I like that every everyone else falling apart gives um, other civilizations time to thrive or space to thrive whenever the huge imperial powers are like falling apart. So um, it's definitely become one of the subjects that I've really enjoyed learning more about. Before we go, I did one. I did find um, just flipping around. I found a really cool page, and it ends with my favorite part of the Gospel of Thomas. So I figured I have to read it. At the heart of Eden was the tree of life, which represented the presence of God. Its branches were the spirits of God, who walked on the earth, as Zechariah saw in his vision. The king was one of these, their chief. And thus Jesus could say, I am the vine and you are the branches, John 15, 5. The first Christians thought of themselves as the branches of the true vine, but also as the new generation of the sons of God, angels upon earth living the life of eternity while still in the world. The leaves of this tree of life were to heal the nations, Revelations 22, 2. The anointed king was also the bond of the eternal covenant, which held all things in their anointed place. I strongly suspect that this eternal covenant was renewed at the great autumn festival for the new year. The life of the king, symbolized by the lifeblood of the substituted animal, was the sign of the divine presence on earth, and this life was used to join together again the spiritual and the material worlds by means of the sprinkling of blood on each side of the temple curtain. Speculating on the basis of a tentatively reconstructed myth must be the least exact of all disciplines, but it may well prove more fruitful than the monstrous exercise of asserting that myth is factual history. It is sad that people have set out on expeditions to remote parts in order to find where the Garden of Eden might once have been long ago, and thus prove in some way that the story was true. Eden is not in space and time, but is the ever-present ideal, the beyond. To speak of the end being like the beginning, as though there were some process of history, is to misrepresent this myth. Two sayings of Jesus in the Gospel of Thomas show the real meaning of Eden. This is Thomas 18. The disciples said to Jesus, Tell us how our end will be. Jesus said, 
Have you discovered, then, the beginning that you look for the end? For where the beginning is there will the end be. Blessed is he who will take his place in the beginning. He will know the end and will not experience death. And this is Thomas 1.13, my favorite. His disciples said to him, When will the kingdom come? Jesus said, It will not come by waiting for it. It will not be a matter of saying, Here it is, or there it is. Rather, the kingdom of the Father is spread out upon the earth, and men do not see it. All right, guys, just a quick note on pricing and quality, and we'll get out of here. Um, I don't think this book is in great condition, but the pages are fine. Um, it costs 15 bucks on Abe Books, and it's shipped from the UK with shipping and taxes totaling $9, so it's pretty expensive. Um, but it was one that I had been looking for for a long time, and I could never find a particularly cheap copy, so... I remember eventually just having it open in a browser window for months and months and never clicking by until finally I just broke down and did it. So anyway, I'm still satisfied regardless. Um, that's going to do it for this episode. If this is something you enjoyed, please like the video, leave a comment, subscribe to the channel, or share it with your friends. Until next time, happy reading. Mm -hmm.